we have to be fair for the people who come on time. Uh, uh, once again, I am uh, Dr. Lalit Lienege, IET uh, Session Chairman, IET Sri Lanka Network Session Chairman. And today we have our traditional uh, monthly evening forum, which we used to have at Daladari Hotel face-to-face, uh, -face, but due to COVID-19, we have been shifted to online option. And uh, this is our third webinar from uh, April, April, May, June. And uh, I welcome all of you. Uh, let others join us. And uh, since we are recording, we will uh, share the entire session uh, among the registrants uh, after the webinar. And uh, we have selected the timely topic, I guess, uh, drone revolution. With the, especially with the COVID-19 and uh, social distancing, the use of drones have been extensively uh, kind of increased. And I saw recently an advertisement from uh, Civil Aviation Authority uh, asking all drone users, suppliers, and uh, manufacturers, everyone to provide information to the Civil Aviation Authority because they are doing a survey uh, about the drone capacity in Sri Lanka. So uh, I think our eminent speaker will talk many things about uh, drones because he is, if not the ex uh, most uh, prominent expert, uh, one of the best in Sri Lanka about drones. He has uh, uh, many years of experience, hands-on experience, and uh, 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 vast knowledge in this subject. Uh, I will not talk about drones now because he has a, uh, he will have an excellent presentation to you. But uh, let me introduce our speaker today, Engineer Professor Rohan Monasinghe. Uh, he's attached to the Department of Electronic and Telecommunication Engineering of the University of Maratua. He was the former head of department. He earned the MInch degree in 1999 and the PhD degree in 2003, both in Advanced Systems Control Engineering from Saga National University, Japan. His main areas of teaching and research are robotics, control systems, unmanned aerial vehicles, underwater robotics, autonomous intelligence systems, artificial intelligence, and system optimization. Professor Munasinghe was part of KAIST, K -I -S -T, Stanford Research Collaboration on Advanced Robotics. He has won awards at the International Inventions Exhibitions in Geneva and in Robo Competitions of India in many occasions. He has undergone training at Commercial Law Development Program in USA on technology transfer. He has completed training on intellectual property at the USPTO, uh, ASPTO, and has completed courses of the World Intellectual Property Organization, the WIPO. He is a member of the National Science and Technology Commission, NASTED, Honorary Advisor to the Vocational and Training Authority, Director of the University Business Linkage Center, UBLC, a member of the Senate, uh, research committee, SRC, and a member of the Intellectual Property Advisory Committee, IPAC, of the University of Maratu. Professor Monosinghe is the chair of the NSF Committee on Engineering, IT, and Architecture. Also serves in the steering committee of the Center for Research and Development of the Ministry of Defense, which I also was a member. We shared uh, many things in, the, in this uh, CRD steering committee. And in the advisory committee of the Sri Lanka Planetarium. He served in the Board of Governors of the Arthur C. Clark Center for Modern Technologies, Board of Directors of the National Engineering Research and Development Center, uh, and NSF Committees on Technology, Science, Popularization, and Nanotechnology. He is the founder chair of IEEE Robotics and Automation Society chapter in Sri Lanka and was the chairman of IEEE Sri Lanka section in 2010. Prof, uh, Professor Munasing is a chartered engineer, senior member of IEEE, member of Robotics and Automation Society of IEEE, and a member of IESL. I kindly invite uh, him to join IET as well, uh, which will uh, be a great value for IET. And uh, with that note, uh, you, you, you may have seen uh, 
his vast uh, exposure in science, technology, and engineering. So uh, without much ado, uh, let me now invite Professor Rohan Munasinghe to deliver his speech. And uh, after the speech, uh, we can take uh, questions from the participants. And uh, I request you to uh, put your questions on the chat session so that uh, we can capture all questions. And at the end, we can take one by one. Uh, otherwise, it will uh, waste time if everyone wants to speak. Uh, and the game rule is uh, everyone should uh, switch off your microphones and videos and let Professor Rohan Munusinga take the uh, stage with his presentation. Over to you, Professor. Professor, your mic is off. Uh, yeah, can you see my uh, screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can see All your right. slide. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Lalit, for the introduction. And uh, thank you very much for everyone uh, for joining in for this uh, session. Uh, it's always a pleasure to me to talk about technology. Uh, to uh, groups in Sri Lanka uh, to inspire them to do uh, uh, innovations and then um, develop products, uh, put it to markets, and then uh, generate revenues for the country. So uh, this is the, the fundamental objective of all these uh, research and development to uh, help develop uh, Sri Lanka. So and um, yeah, I will uh, join IET. So <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, right. So uh, the, the today's topic is uh, 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 drone uh, revolution, right? Uh, drones are revolutionizing the whole world um, in uh, various ways. Uh, we have been uh, uh, doing uh, drone research for quite some time. I started my first drone project in 2006-07 period as a, as a final year project. And uh, since then, we have been continuously developing technology, drone technology. And uh, today's presentation, I really want to show you the local stuff, Sri Lankan stuff, right? Uh, we are a very capable uh, nation uh, for some reason. This capability doesn't come out uh, for various reasons. Uh, we are weak in uh, working together. We are working. Uh, uh, we are weak in uh, appreciating others to uh, figure out others' capabilities, and then networking, right, and sustaining our collaborations. So that part is missing in our culture for some reasons. So that is why, even though we have very capable people. Uh, uh, we haven't seen much of uh, innovations uh, come into the markets. So innovations and uh, product to come into market uh, uh, needs a lot of people. And that is fundamental uh, uh, truth. Uh, single person cannot do everything. So th that is a failure equation. So uh, we need to get uh, together engineers, technologists, laborers, managers, marketing people, politicians in a well-connected hierarchy, then only we can bring something out to the markets. Unfortunately, it is not happening in, uh, in Sri Lanka yet. Right, so let me start off uh, with uh, showing you this commercial drone market figures. Uh, <clears throat> commercial drones, um, I, I have taken only commercial drones here, right, uh, of the internet. Uh, you can see the growth from 2016 uh, um, up until now, 2020, uh, then the forecast till 2025. So you can see this histogram climbing uh, monotonically, right? And uh, uh, every pillar, if you uh, move upwards, you can see a circle, green circle with a number that is the value, the revenue in uh, billions of us so that number also increasing 
the size you can see by 2025 it is projected to be 12.6 billion us dollars that is the drone market size uh, commercial drone market size okay commercial drones uh, and if you look at uh, the applications where are these uh, drones are right so what are the major applications you will uh, clearly see this uh, graph here right there you can see 38 percent of the commercial drones are deployed in aerial photography and you know, aerial videography that that's for sure you have seen in sri lanka also uh, small drones phantom dji chinese drone is uh, number one most popular and then the which is uh, the uh, mavic pro the successor of phantom pro how people getting onto that one a phantom is is kind of discontinued now so these two drones basically designed for photography and videography uh, takes 38 percent of the market and then you have the other things surveying mapping gis now if you ask uh, uh, a surveyor that you want to uh, 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 survey uh, your land if it is a big land definitely he will bring a drone and you can see that that is the state of the art for surveying industry drones surveying drones uh, then you have the real estate uh, the construction and then agriculture these are the five main areas applications where drones have already been deployed and they take more than half of the uh, the circle you can see the other applications are actually emerging uh, like for example uh, agriculture is emerging right now it is uh, about seven percent but i'm sure in the next uh, five to ten years this will grow uh, everything will grow but particularly agriculture uh, field will be invaded by the drones there's one thing missing here that is the package delivery drones you have seen drones bringing packages i will also show some of our drones designed for package delivery uh, delivering a small package to, to a distance uh, not far distances maybe few kilometers drop the package and come back uh, that has not taken huge part here not because of any any problem with the technology it is because occupying the air space is a is a serious undertaking rather uh, other owners like for example uh, the low flying uh, military aircrafts are there low flying uh, uh, choppers are there and uh, pilot training is happening um, so that is why uh, they don't want to take any risk basically civil aviation in any country they don't uh, like drones to come into airspace, uh, making necessary problems. But uh, this is just a matter of time. Uh, inevitable situations like drones will uh, fly with packages in the air will happen in the next within the next decade. Then we can see that part also in this uh, graph. Uh, then uh, i just want to say something about going back to this one uh, th there you can see only the commercial drone market which is about 12.6 million projected to 2025 but if you look at the whole thing uh, including the uh, consumer drone markets the toys diy etc the actual market is forecasted to be about 40 billion dollars by 2024 2025 it's about 40 uh, 40 billion market within the next five years right now let me show you uh, some of the drone so now this is becoming now techy a little bit now uh, there are uh, drone types the first one over here is a multi-rotor multi-rotor type so let me show you this uh, video right <laughs> Can you see the video and hear the sounds? Uh, not yet. Uh, you have to click uh, uh, something in Zoom. Uh, in your share screen uh, down, you will have something uh, called, uh, I cannot exactly remember, two buttons where you need to uh, uh, allow videos to. 
Yeah, so you, you don't see the video, right? You yeah. Video. I, uh, you have two buttons uh, under your screen. From the uh, share computer sound and optimize yeah. screen sharing. Uh, yeah. yeah, I know that. Um, so let me get back again. Uh, Yeah, so um, so I already clicked that button, uh, share uh, computer sounds. Right. Um, and the video? You have to uh, click another button, I think, to share a video. Yeah, that one is disabled for some reason. Uh, why is that? I had the same problem when delivering lecture last week uh, to my students. Uh, Hmm. So uh, if I uh, uh, the two uh, right, one is uh, disabled, like no? Yeah, one is disabled. Uh, our guys, uh, Vintya, Priyanka, you have any solution for that? Uh, okay. Now fine, now fine, I got it. All right, okay. All right, now see whether you can uh, see the video. Uh, not, not, uh, we can see the uh, voice. All right, uh, looks like it's coming, uh, hold on. Since the screen is blank, we can hear a uh, road mm, sound. I know, I know. Yeah. So each and every video I have to share separately. That's why. These are linked uh -huh. videos. That's why. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll do this. Uh, I have to uh, share. Uh, Don't worry. Take your time, Professor. Yeah. So now you should be able to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. So every video I have to share uh, separately. Now what you see here is a multi-rotor type of UAV drone carrying a package fully autonomous uh, from a home position and flying to a destination, right? Uh, and then land at the destination. That is one thing. Uh, then the second uh, type of drones or uh, drones is actually fixed wing, like a plane. You have the wings and all, right? So uh, uh, let me show it to you here. Right. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. But unfortunately, I have to share it again. So, can you see the uh, the drone and the, the sound? Yeah, right. So this drone is another locally built drone. Uh, you know this place. This is Bandarnayak International Airport. Uh, this drone is carrying a camera, 24 megapixel Sony Alpha uh, camera. Uh, it is taking photos of the airport uh, and these photos are connected together to make the entire map of the airport premises. 
Alu sekian anda. So that is uh, also fully autonomous uh, drone. Uh, you plan the mission and then throw it to the space. And uh, the operator, the manual uh, uh, remote pilot, RC pilot takes it to a certain altitude and then uh, engage the autopilot. And after that, the drone will fly autonomously according to the uh, planned mission. So while it is flying, it takes the photos and uh, this is uh, how it lands uh, using a parachute. So it is very safe uh, landing. So that's about it. Now there's another category which is here, this one. Multi rotor plus fixed wings, right? The the two earlier versions together. So let me show you this one. Now this is taking off like a copter vertically, right? Uh, when it comes to a certain uh, elevation, it starts flying like a plane. So the entire mission uh, is basically a, a plane mission, like a plane. So you can send the plane to whatever distance you want, carrying whatever payload and it will uh, uh, accomplish the mission just like a plane and when it comes home when it comes home it will pass it, the control configuration to a copter like this now it will hold the position in the air just like a copter then gradually descend down to land. So this is what is called the uh, VTOL drone, vertical takeoff and landing drone. So this is going to be the new uh, drone type, which is becoming uh, more popular than the previous two drone types, right? Now. Now, if you, if, you, if you put all these uh, uh, three types together and uh, make a good judgment, the first one over here, very easy to operate, right? So, uh, it takes off vertically, lands vertically. So, therefore, you don't need a big runaway or open space to take off and land. However, it, is, it doesn't have wings. Therefore, it is energy inefficient as it flies it consumes a lot of battery because it has to uh, uh, generate equal and opposite thrust that, uh, to the weight and that consumes a lot of power. That is why these multi-copters cannot fly long distances. And they are basically for 10, 15, 20 minute endurances but latest battery technology can bring them to about uh, 40, 50 minute or one hour maximum. Uh, the second type here, the wing type, everybody knows it. Um, you need the huge open area for landing because when the drone comes for landing, the approach distance has to be there. There cannot be tall trees or buildings nearby. So, but you don't find that kind of open space nowadays, right? Especially in urban areas. So, deploying the winged drones, the second type here, is a question in the populated areas. But the good thing is that these drones are highly energy efficient, which means they don't need to generate a thrust equal to the weight of the drone. But maybe just 10, 20 percent of that is enough. Just need to push it forward, the wings will generate the thrust. So that is why winged drones can fly hours and hours. Uh, so these two types have pluses and minuses, but once you put them together into this third type of drone, you get the best drone, which can take off and land almost anywhere, doesn't need a 
big open space because they are like copters, vertical takeoff and landing. And also they fly like a plane into the mission. So therefore they are very energy efficient so that you can fly hours and hours. So that is why it is becoming uh, very popular. Now, if you look at the drone capabilities these days, right? The drones have many flight modes. So what are these modes? For example, you can fly them entirely manually, manual control, right? But the, uh, there are other modes like stabilize, for example. Drone can fly uh, level. And if it's a multi-copter, it can hover in a, at a certain altitude. And also there are uh, other modes like fly by wire. For example, when you have fly by wire mode of operation, drone will not roll too much to, to the left or to the right, right? It will maintain stable fly. And uh, fully autonomous flying, which is going from one point to another through number of wire points and auto landing. You don't have to land the plane yourself. You can have auto landing, but there are things that you have to do before the drone can perfectly land uh, itself. And altitude hold. Drones can hold the altitude. Drones can loiter. Drones can go around in circles, right? Around a certain point on the ground. And RTL, return to launch, which means at any moment of time, you can ask the drone come home. That's it, very high level command. Drone will find its way back home, come and land. So with these very high level capabilities, now uh, it's a very smart machine, drones. You can uh, customize drones to various applications uh, with assurance uh, and safety. And also drones have the second bullet here, the fail safe. Right? Because when you deploy drones, things can fail, right? Sometimes you don't get the signals with the GCS. Sometimes you don't have your radio signal received by the drone. Sometimes the GPS of the drone will not work or it will be jammed by jammers. So these things are possible. Uh, but you can set the fail safe settings in the drone so that uh, nothing very seriously bad would happen, right? Uh, in uh, these conditions, like for example, if the GCS fails, you can ask, uh, set the condition in the drone to come home. So when the uh, uh, drone uh, notices that it doesn't have the, the, the connection with the GCS, it will abort the mission and come home. So nothing bad will happen. And also when the drone understand, uh, oh my God, uh, the radio connection is not there. Uh, the drone will come home, uh, but you have to you have to make that settings. So that is why some people don't do that properly. That is why the civil aviation authority in Sri Lanka and all the other civil aviation authorities in other countries also uh, uh, be reluctant to relax the rules for drones because people don't uh, 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 stick to the uh, the rules and regulations and do it properly. Uh, some people can fly drones without any fails. Right? And one day it will make a big damage to somebody. And also GPS, uh, when uh, the GPS glitches are there, you can ask the, the drone to hold the position. You, can, uh, you can't ask the drone to come home because without GPS drone can't do that. But else uh, you can ask the drone, okay, stay where you are. I will come and get you, right? So all these uh, fail safe uh, settings can be uh, pre uh, configured. So professional drone operators, they stick to these uh, rules and regulations and they don't make any threat to anybody. And in the recent times, uh, if you look at the technology, how um, it has been developed, uh, collision avoidance has been added to the drones. Some of the Chinese drones, they have these collision avoidance drones using sonar, LIDAR and infrared. Okay, so uh, what they do is that as the drone flies, they look forward to any uh, uh, obstacles nearby, usually short range, not uh, 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 far obstacles. We don't consider them as obstacles. When they only get near enough, they become an obstacle. They are detected and uh, then you can ask the drone what to do or push back 
stay, stop, or whatever. Uh, that uh, 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 feature is already there. And then more recent uh, times, last couple of years, vision-based uh, landing uh, and mission intelligence and big data connectivity, um, these are the areas where people are now trying to connect with the drones. Like for example, uh, if you have a big data connectivity to a drone, right? You can make the drone very smart and it has all the information about uh, whatever area, maybe uh, forest, maybe transportation, maybe construction. Uh, drone, drones can take decisions and deploy themselves. And also using machine intelligence, drones will be able to figure out people on the ground, uh, can locate uh, suspicious activities on the ground and then communicate it to the uh, authorities to take decisions. And also using uh, vision-based uh, landing, drone, drones can be uh, made uh, capable of landing autonomously on a certain point, even without any GPS. So these capabilities are uh, on the horizon now. They will be incorporated to the drones within the next uh, decade. So uh, if you are a drone uh, uh, um, hobbyist, if you want to build a drone, these are the three steps you have to follow. You have to first achieve the stabilization stage, which means if it is a fixed wing drone, it should be able to fly level, right? Without your intervention. When you release the sticks on the, uh, the remote controller, right? And you set it to stabilize mode, it should be able to fly level, right? No, it doesn't climb, doesn't descend, no rolls left or right, it should fly level. And if you are doing a, a multicopter, it should hover, right? It should keep the position, doesn't move left or right, forward, backward, doesn't drift, keeps the position. It doesn't come down or go up. So that is the basic thing you have to do. And then uh, on top of that, you can have the navigation loop which is at a low frequency, uh, operating at a low frequency, like five hertz. Whereas the stabilization has to happen at a faster rate, like uh, 50 to about 300 hertz uh, uh, frequency. In the navigation part, what you do is, so you instruct the drone to go from here to there, right? Point A to B, like that. And drone will follow using the GPS, right? When you have this uh, stabilization and navigation capabilities, you can think about the other things also, auto takeoff, auto landing, loiter, etc. Then you are ready to deploy the drone for application. So what are the applications? Uh, it can be aerial photography, videography, can be a surveying mission, maybe agriculture. So looking at the crops, whether they are healthy or not, surveillance, uh, delivering a package, or uh, inspection of a pipeline, uh, traffic uh, estimate on the roads, uh, various applications. So uh, when you deploy the drone for an application, right, you need to have hardware software development on top of uh, the basic drone that is stabilization and navigation. So let me now tell you a bit uh, more details uh, into this stabilization navigation part, right? Maybe you want to know how it happened, right? Uh, so there you can see a drone, a multi-copter and uh, the four motors, brushless DC motors and their uh, electronic speed controllers. These yellow ones are speed controllers, right? Now, uh, by combining the speeds of these four motors, you do the maneuvers of the drone. Like for example, if you have these uh, all four uh, motors running with high level of power, the drone will climb. And if you reduce the power of all four drones, the all four motors rather, the drone will descend down. Okay. And that is what is called the uh, altitude loop, the green box here, lowest one, altitude. Now, if you increase the power of the two motors here and reduce the speed of these two motors, right, the drone will pitch up. 
pitch up. There's a pitch loop over here, right? So uh, if you reduce the speed of the two front motors and increase the speed of the two rear motors, uh, the drone is, will pitch down, which means it will move forward. So that is a pitch loop. Okay, so I can go on and explain you what happens if you do that way. Like, if you increase the speed of the two left motors here and reduce the speed of these two motors on the right, uh, the drone will pitch to the right. Okay, roll to the right. Right, then it will move to the right. So this way you can make the movements of the drone forward, backward, up, down, left, right, right by controlling the roll loop, pitch loop, your loop, and I'll do it. By the way, this your loop, when you change the heading, what you do is maybe you can uh, increase the speed of these two motors, right, opposite side, and reduce the speed of the other two uh, motors on the opposite side. Then what you do is uh, you your, you control the heading of the, uh, the drone, right? You turn from the east to the west, uh, to northeast, like that. So with all these four control loops, you can do whatever you want to the drone, okay? Now who is uh, controlling all these four loops? It is the flight controller. So here what you see is a locally built flight controller, our own flight controller. We built this in 2012 as one of the final year projects. And we flew a small uh, fully autonomous drone with this flight controller to verify the accuracy. So uh, the, the flight controller can stabilize uh, the drone. Now, if you want to do the navigation and put it into an advanced mission, you need to have additional uh, sensors. Like for example, you need to have a GPS, right? Interface to the flight controller. And you need to have a compass interface to the flight controller. So compass will, help the flight controller to change the direction, heading, GPS will let the flight controller know the position, and also you can have a sonar if you want to detect the altitude in low altitudes, when you do the landing and takeoff, uh, sonar will come in handy, even though there is a barometer, semiconductor, uh, st solid state barometer here, you can have additional sonar here. And also if you want to see the airspeed, the flying speed, you can have the airspeed sensor here, right? Even though you have the GPS telling you where you are, your position, and by differentiating, you can calculate the speed, the ground course. In addition to that, you can have a uh, intrinsic speed measurement using the airspeed sensor. And also, if you want to control the drone, you need to have RF receiver attached to the flight controller. So through the RF receiver, you send your commands, remote controller commands, roll pitch your uh, to the flight control. So when the, the drone is in the air, it is moving, right? Uh, the, the, the parameters, uh, variables change, the speed, altitude, roll, pitch, yo, the currents of the motors, etc. They all can be communicated back to your ground control station. This is where you can see uh, what the drone is doing, the whereabouts, everything. Okay, so this is simply all what you know about the internal hardware arrangement configuration uh, of a multi-copter, multi-rotor drone. Now, if you do a, a winged drone, a plane rather, nothing will change except the drone, right? You can see here, the same roll, pitch, yo, altitude loops are there. Uh, and now this time you have aileron elevator rod, which means, the, the commands of the roll loop that is rolling left and right will go to the ailerons. The pitch loop, which is climbing up or down, will go to the elevator, right? And your loop, turning left, turning right, the heading correction will go to uh, the rudder, right? Actually rudder and aileron both. Uh, altitude loop will go to the throttle the power of the motor. So others will remain uh, unchanged. Okay.
Now let's look at the application. Then you saw uh, that the number one application uh, of drones today is aerial survey. So therefore, that is why we also in Sri Lanka, when you de develop our drones, once we have developed the core drone technology in Sri Lanka, the first application we targeted was also drone uh, survey. So there what we do is, let's say you want to create a survey map of this area, the top left figure here, right? This is the area you want to uh, survey, right? So we plan the mission like this, this green, uh, sorry, yellow lines are the, this is a path of the drone. So it, it flies zigzag, right, like that, uh, while taking photos. And on the right hand side, you can see the photos taken. See, there are so many photos taken. You can see the photos are not on a straight line because this is the path of the drone. It doesn't go straight line, right? Because the crosswind and all, right, it moves back and forth, sideways. However, when you take the photos, you make sure you can see it here in uh, this photo, uh, the two positions of the drone, the blue one and the red one. When it takes the photos, there's a huge overlap between consecutive photos, such as about 80% um, of a photo taken at a point, right? Will be recorded in the next photo also. So 80% overlap forward direction and also lateral direction is about uh, 75, 70%. Uh, so therefore, because of this huge overlap, right? You can see on this uh, photo here, there's a single point on the ground, single point on the ground, maybe a piece of rock, right? And you can see these green lines going to the photos, which means all of these photos, right, to which these green lines are connected, they have this piece of rock in there. So you can see there are so many, maybe like about 20 photos, right, in this collection has this particular rock in there. So huge redundancy because of the huge overlap. So when you put the, all these photos into a computer, by the way, these photos are actually geotagged, which means when the photo is taken, the drone will write the GPS coordinate, right? Where this photo was taken. So the processing software knows roughly the location of the photo. So it will arrange the photos accordingly and then look at the images. Then the software will understand, ah, this particular rock is seen by 20 odd photos here. So then they will arrange the photos precisely, change their direction, orientation with respect to each other, the neighboring photos, and create the big maps like this that you see here. This is a University Moratua map. It is not just one photograph. It is created using more than 600 photos, more than 600 photos. And there you can see another one, a landslide slide in Aranayaka. Remember the landslide? happened there, the deadly one, more than 100 people died. This is that land site. This was created by our own drones using another some 400 uh, photographs. Okay. So once you create these photographs, you can also create the, what is called the contour map. You can see it over here. This is part of uh, Kantale Sugar Corporation, right? Uh, recently we did the map, uh, not recently, a couple of years back, uh, the contour map for Kantale Sugar Corporation using our own drones. And uh, this elevation map here you can see is uh, very important for the engineers, the irrigation and civil engineers to plan their roadways, the waterways, uh, the other buildings, etc. So the technology is in our hand now, the drone technology. So let me show uh, some of these videos, uh, this one. Uh, Again, I have to uh, share that with you. You can see the map, right? Uh, can you see the map? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Right, okay. So this is uh, 
collection of uh, some 600 plus photographs, right? And then uh, uh, the, 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 the mosaic created. So this is University of Moratua. You can see the ground and uh, this is electronic department uh, uh, where I am uh, located right now. So our main building, Sumandasa building, the library. This is a very high precision map, a survey map. Using this one, you can take measurements, uh, any distance of a roof, uh, volume of a certain uh, um, roof, right? Areas, uh, what is the ground area here, right? In acres, uh, to a very high precision, you can take the measurements. Right. Then uh, let me uh, show you uh, another one. That is this. Uh, this is uh, Aranayaka. Uh, Landslide. We deployed one of our drones to uh, map the uh, landslide. So this is the top of the mountain. Uh, and this is where the mud uh, slided down hill, uh, disappearing. <laughs> Uh, making the building, the houses, everything disappear. So, using these maps, you can take the measurements. That is the important thing: uh, the distances, the areas, and also volumes. You can see this uh, photogrammetry, right? It's not very precise uh, in constructing. You can see these trees and all are not precisely constructed, right? But the idea is uh, not to uh, reconstruct the the whole thing precisely. Uh, but to make the aerial map precise, right? To take measurements, uh, distance, uh, areas, and volumes. Right. Now, uh, <clears throat> there's a new technology coming to the drones. That is what is called the RTK or PPK. RTK stands for real time kinematic. PPK means uh, post processed kinematics. So remember the two words. Uh, I'm trying to let you know not only just drones, but other technologies that are getting connected with the drones. Eventually, drone becomes a vehicle, right? It's just a means. Uh, on top of that, you can put other tools uh, and you can deploy it for a certain application. So there on the left uh, side photo here, you can see, uh, by the way, why we need RTK PPK? This is basically to increase the precision of position information, right? You know that if you use a normal consumer grade GPS, right? And if you keep it on your hand, you get a number, right? Latitude, longitude, and you can convert this, that into uh, meters using a certain uh, geodetic coordinate frame, right? And you get your position. So this position can be uh, 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 erroneous as, as, as big as about five meters, plus or minus five meters. So that is the uh, accuracy of a consumer grade uh, GPS. Now, if you, if you think that if you have five meter plus or minus error in your photographs, right? Taken by a drone and when you put them together and create the map, Right? You cannot expect a better accuracy, okay? Unless you use very high precision precision uh, measurements on the ground. So the surveyors do that. They don't depend on the drone photography, right? Alone, but they put marks on the ground and they capture those marks on the drone imagery and go to those points 
and annotate those points with very high precision uh, coordinates using total stations. I think you know that, right? Then they re-optimize the map so that it, it will become more accurate. Now, you don't have to do this if you have RTK, PPK, because RTK and PPK will give the drone, right, that accuracy right away. So, this is how it works. So, when the drone here on the left photo, right, has this uh, RPK or PPK GPS, right, it will always communicate with the ground station or base station. So, these are small devices, like, for example, like size of a matchbox. Uh, the RTK sensor with a, about uh, 100 uh, square centimeter antenna, right? Flat panel of uh, uh, metal, maybe aluminum foil. Uh, just that. So these units are receiving information from the GNSS, uh, the satellite, GPS satellite network or any other uh, uh, GPS network. And uh, the total station here, the base station here, is a known point. So it receives these signals from the satellite network and it knows the error, right? The satellites say a certain uh, position, but the base station knows its position accurately. So it can calculate the error. Once it calculates the error, it can communicate to the drone the error so that the drone, like error means uh, easterly or westerly or northerly or westerly, uh, southern. So, all these two directions, right? Left, right, up, down. Uh, how many meters is the error right now? So, it will, drone will immediately correct that error and uh, geotag the, the photos accordingly. So, that way you can increase your accuracy to about three to four centimeters. So, that is a, that is a huge improvement, right? So, your survey map is as accurate as uh three, three to four centimeter plus or minus so that, that's a very good achievement now if you cannot uh, have this uh, rtk configuration where you have a total station communicating to the drone in real time right you can do the ppk post process kinematic they are what you do is you have the uh, uh, one unit station on the ground keep collecting data and the drone has another unit collecting the same data okay and after the drone flight is completed you bring these two files together and put it to a, a, a cloud process where this correction is calculated using not only these uh, satellites that you see there but all the other ground stations nearby like a network for example right not only this local station, there can be so many other local networks which are receiving the same information, same time, and you can do a much better correction, right? The corrections are because the errors of the GPS is basically because of the atmospheric problems, right? Uh, rainy um, conditions, uh, cloudy conditions, um, the temperature and all these things will uh, introduce this five meter error in the position and now with the uh, post processed kinematic you can finally uh, smoothly uh, do this process the workflow so that you calculate the positions very accurately so this is what we are doing right now uh, at moro tour ppk uh, geotagging so that our drones uh, can generate very high accuracy maps so uh, let me show you uh, another uh, uh, video clip here right uh this one so this small drone uh, is, is, uh, is really advanced stuff there you can see the camera and all this has a post process kinematic gps ppk so, Landing now. when it flies, uh, it will collect that position information as a separate file. When it comes home, we get the images and that position file and communicate it with the, uh, uh, the, the other file 
generated in the uh, base station and we do the uh, uh, post process kinematic to improve the accuracy. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, developed uh, the drones including uh, PPK uh, technology. So that is a serious uh, development. Now, uh, this one we named uh, Seahawk uh, is more than a drone, we call it uh, unmanned aerial vehicle, right? Uh, this drone uh, can have about three hour endurance. It's a medium range UAV. It, it is uh, powered by a gasoline uh, engine, right? And it can map uh, about 120 square kilometer per flight in that area, right? Uh, 120 square kilometer can be mapped in single flight. So if you look at uh, the entire Sri Lanka, right? Um, leaving out the uh, jungles and other things, if you really want to map a survey map of Sri Lanka, you need to have 416 flights of this drone, okay? And if you have, let's say a five drone fleet, five of these drones, so it is about a three month work. So entire Sri Lanka, can be mapped within about three months using five of these drones. So this is the power of drones. And now imagine usual surveying, if you want to do in entire Sri Lanka, how long does it take? It has never happened in Sri Lanka, by the way. So it is extremely difficult. Uh, people have to walk on the ground, very difficult accessibility, right? And making this uh, surveying using poles and tear lights, extremely difficult. Now the drones have changed the landscape entirely for surveying and now nobody's walking on the ground but drones are deployed to take photos and then the geotagging using PPK or RTK technologies and on the computer you generate the map with very high precision. So this is what the drones can do uh, for aerial surveying. Now uh, we have taken it forward from uh, this point, the Seahawk, to Hornet. This is the Hornet, uh, which is under construction right now at Moratour. Because of the COVID, we had to uh, uh, temporarily hold this uh, project. Uh, it's only now we are beginning to uh, we are resuming the work. You can see it's, uh, it's for international market basically, not for Sri Lanka, right? Uh, this one is also the same. Uh, Sri Lanka is a too small of a market for this kind of high tech products. We had to target the region and the uh, international market. So this is a VTOL uh, drone, whereas this one is not a VTOL drone. You don't see any uh, 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 quad mode motors here, it's just a, a plane. But this one will carry uh, propellers here, vertical propellers here and here to give it a vertical takeoff and landing. And there's an engine here, petrol engine, to push it forward like a plane, so that most of the uh, 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 the mission, it will fly like a plane. And there you can see the payload bay here, is a sizable payload bay. We can uh, change the payload to a camera if you want to do an aerial surveying mission there, or if you can have, you can have uh, a package, if you want to deliver a package, maybe some blood packed packets or uh, test swabs in, in case of COVID uh, from a collecting center to the testing center. So there are many applications and it will have um, uh, th about three hour endurance. It's a long endurance flight. So which means you can take it off from maybe Ratmalan and land it in Jaffa. Now the other emerging uh, uh, application for drones is agriculture. So what does the drones uh, uh, do to agriculture? It's basically like this. Uh, we are talking about huge agricultural lands, paddy or corn or whatever, right? It's, it's uh, impossible to monitor uh, the, the stress plants in a huge area uh, manually. So uh, you can deploy a drone like this, for example, with some sensors on board, 
So the drone flies along this uh, over the crop field, huge crop field, collecting images, right? And then you process those images on a computer very quickly. And then let's say you can figure out what are the good plants and the uh, weak plants, healthy and unhealthy plants. Then you know the, their locality, you know, which area has uh, big plants. Then what you do is you deploy another drone, like a copter kind of drone here with a, a tank of full of fertilizer or maybe pesticide, weedicide, whatever required chemical. It will uh, reach out to those spots, right? And spray the required amount and come back. This is the clinical delivery of chemicals in agriculture without just spraying all over the place not knowing what are the good plants, what are, what are the bad plants, right? This technique will figure out what are the, uh, the weak plants and deliver right amount of fertilizer to that location. So we call it precision agriculture. So uh, let me talk about this agriculture going out of drones to the technology where we can uh, 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 differentiate the healthy plants and unhealthy plants. Now you can see this uh, spectrum here starting from 400 uh, nanometers to about 850 nanometers, right? Uh, and uh, the green line is for green vegetation, which means healthy veg vegetation. And the red one, red line is for the stressed vegetation because of uh, a disease or something or not having enough water or uh, nutrition the red one is uh, not healthy now if you look at the visible spectrum up to about uh, uh, 700 nanometer the two lines are closely apart right you can see red one is up a bit from the green one but not seriously noticeable right but if you cross uh, the 700 nanometer area of course, uh, the, the light is not visible here, yeah, but you can see a, a marked difference between the stressed plants and the healthy plants. So therefore, just by looking at the plants, you can't tell for sure about the health of the plant. If you want to tell about the health of the plant, you need to look at the invisible area. Okay. So we, we developed a drone for this purpose, a very small drone with this uh, small sensor here. You can see uh, slightly bigger than a, a box of matches, right? And the drone has uh, the, the flight controllers, the parachute and everything. And uh, uh, by the way, this one is the sensor, the top right photo. You can see the small box looking downward is the sensor. It's a multi-spectral sensor and together with uh, comes this small part here, another box kind of thing, which looks upwards, not downwards, right? Uh, this is the sunshine sensor. It tells you uh, the strength of the sunshine because this is photogrammetry. You're taking photos and looking at the plant, uh, how much they reflect light, right? You need to know uh, how bright the sun is, right? At that moment, <laughs> otherwise your measurements are not correct. Uh, so if you look at the sensor uh, down here, you can see uh, it has five cameras, five miniature cameras. It has red edge, which is 735 nanometer. You have red camera, 660 nanometer. You have green camera, 550 nanometer. You have near infrared, that is 790 nanometer. The green and red are visible but red edge and NIR are not visible. They are above 700, okay? So you are collecting this information, two visible uh, wavelengths and two invisible wavelengths. These wavelengths, if you put it on this graph, you can see the green is here, red is here, right? And the red edge is here, and this is near infrared, okay? Now you take a series of photos, a collection of photos, just like uh, when you do a surveying mission, right? You take overlapping photos and then you combine the photos together, create the mosaic, right? The map. And this time you are doing it for four different colors, red map, green map, 
red edge map and near infrared map okay so in addition to that you can have the normal rgb camera that is over here that is also there so this is the mission when the drone flies with the multispectral camera it flies like that collecting uh, images and comes home and after that we take the sd card out of the camera put it into the computer download all the images geotag them and then combine them together using uh, the features on the ground so this is the photo collection of photos right and uh, now we come to mathematics right now if you look at these two trees here plants right the left one is healthy right one is not healthy okay now the healthy plants if you look at the near infrared and the red for example just for an example right the healthy plants emit about eight percent of red light and about 50 percent of near infrared light okay this is average uh, versus uh, a near infrared a uh, uh, stress plant right not very healthy plant which emits about 30 percent rate about 40 percent near infrared all right so there's no question about it right because you know uh, healthy plants don't emit too much of red because they they don't look red okay whereas uh, unhealthy plants look more red okay so that is our observation but if you go to science you know photosynthesis absorb a lot of red light so therefore good plants which are doing photosynthesis well do not reflect red light much okay so either way you know it now uh, if you look at this uh, equation ndvi maybe some of you guys have heard of it uh, normalized difference vegetation index right this is the equation ndvi equation so what is that it is a ratio between nir minus red and nir plus red just that very simple equation now if you put that onto a, a healthy plant right what would you get nir minus red so nir is 50 minus red is 8 50 minus 8 divided by 50 plus 8 so that is 42 or 58 about 72 percent or 0.72 and if you do the same for a stress plant over here right nir minus red that is 40 minus 30 40 minus 30 divided by 40 plus 30 that is about 10 over 70 14 percent now see the difference right so by combining this reflectance of different wavelengths you can calculate the ndvi so that you see for healthy plants ndvi is higher for stress plants ndvi is lower so you clearly differentiate on your crop field maybe it is tea paddy corn whatever where are the healthy plants where are the unhealthy plants okay so when you put that onto your computer you will see something like this you can now assume uh, false colors uh, to the map where green areas are high ndvi red areas are low ndvi and they, you know for sure these red areas there's something wrong with the plants and you need to take action immediately if you can take action immediately water these areas so put some nitrogen whatever and uh, then uh, after about uh, a week you can do the mission again and see how these red areas have turned into green areas so if you do this for a season closely monitoring the crop uh, field you can maintain healthy plants right mostly healthy plants in your plantation uh, eventually at the end of the season you get a, a big harvest yield okay so this is proper crop management using drone technology So once you know the red areas, right? Now you can have a drone with uh, uh, 
a tank full of fertilizer, right? And uh, to the drone, you can feed this uh, information, uh, this uh, red information areas, okay? So drone will fly over the red areas only, not uh, over green areas and spray the right amount of fertilizer, okay? So this way, so what is the difference you are going to uh, introduce to the field of agriculture? First, you reduce chemical usage. Now you are not spraying all over, right? You spray wherever it is needed and the right amount because you can see this red color intensity, which means if it is bright red, which means more nutrition is required, more nitrogen is required. If it is not very uh, uh, intense uh, red color, then you know you need to spray a little amount. So this way you can adjust your spray speed and uh, save your chemicals, right? When you, when you reduce your chemical usage, you reduce the human exposure, right? Uh, for two reasons. When you deploy drones, there's no humans involved, so no exposure. Even though people are there, the exposure will be minimal because the drone will spray only the right amount. So no health hazards, right? Uh, no water contamination due to chemicals overdosing and reduce uh, cost production, cost of production, okay? The labor cost is reduced, chemical uh, cost is reduced. And also you, because you keep monitoring your crop field, making sure most of the plants are healthy, you get a higher yield. Right, production goes up, and uh, you don't pollute the environment. You don't overdose the soil, so you make it sustainable for agriculture, and also good health. So there are so many good things about this. Right, so therefore this is extremely important that we introduce drone technology to our agriculture. So I will skip that. Then let me take uh, sample delivery drones, right? Drones are coming into the airspace with packages sooner or later, right? Sooner rather than later. Uh, this drone that we developed at Moratua, we initially did it for Kotharawala Defense University. Uh, and uh, we are building a second drone of this one. Uh, we are working with the, the medical uh, people to make it deliver uh, uh, test swabs. Like you can see it over here, uh, about 20 uh, test tubes, right? With some uh, test swabs in it. Uh, you can transport from one place to another. Uh, we are in early stage of development, but uh, some uh, promising results have already been obtained. So uh, let me show you this video of uh, our delivery drone. Right. So this is another V fold drone, right? Vertical step of and landing drone. Um, when it comes to the elevation, it will fly like a plane. You can see it here in a moment. Now uh, it is flying like a plane and the quad rotor motors are not working anymore, just a plane. It goes to the destination carrying this uh, package, small package. So when it comes to the destination, it will all the position in the air like copter you can see it in a moment and then drop the package using a parachute like that you can see the parachute coming down somebody can catch it and the drone starts going back 
to home location. And once it uh, comes home, right, you don't have to do anything. It will uh, hold the position again at the landing spot and then uh, land smoothly like that. So that technology is there. So we are trying to commercialize some of these technologies for the benefit of Sri Lanka. And uh, this one is uh, another package delivery drone, but this one is more uh, uh, closer to being commercialized, right? It is a, a multi-copter drone with uh, eight uh, propellers and uh, it can deliver a package to a destination fully autonomously using a thread. So uh, let me show you that video. So now this video starts with the mobile application. So you use this mobile application and you log into your online uh, shopping store, right? Uh, and uh, you are the customer and you go to the store, you pick up what you want and you want to purchase this uh, jacket, right? And you place the order to pay money and then you say, I want it to be delivered by a drone and you mark your location. Right. This is my home location, deliver, and you also can set the time of delivery. So your home at this time, 346, I want the package to be delivered, 346. Order is confirmed. And then in the back end, uh, the uh, online store will have the uh, warehouse where there's a drone. And somebody will uh, attach the package to the drone. The drone has all the information where to deliver. So it flies to the destination autonomously. As it flies, uh, the customer can check. Just like you see your pickup, uh, pick me or Uber is coming to pick you up. Very much the same way you see the drone is coming to your location. So you can uh, go outside to a little open area and wait for the drone to come. So when it comes to the destination, when the drone comes to the destination, it will confirm with the uh, recipient, the customer, uh, if the package can be delivered. So once it is confirmed, the package is delivered. Right. The drone doesn't land in unknown territories, right? Uh, but you can use thread, it will deliver the package. And after that, it will release the thread and fly back. Right. So now the drone flies. While all these things are happening on the ground, the online store can monitor the process whether the package has been delivered, whether the customer is satisfied or not. Right? So, this is uh, very close to being commercialized, and we are looking for uh, a partner just to be able to uh, take it worldwide. Okay, so uh, that is the end of my presentation for today. I need to make some time for your discussion also. So now let me summarize, wrap up the, uh, the talk today. So the first point I want to stress on is that uh, uh, drone technology uh, and the capabilities have uh, developed uh, very seriously over the last decade. Uh, and they are now very promising tools and means for various applications, uh, 
uh, aerial surveying, uh, agriculture, delivery, uh, disaster management, etc., etc. So uh, the, there's no risk today uh, if you stick to proper practice with the drones. Uh, the risk is very minimal. Okay. The second point I want to stress is uh, the drones have been historically military tools, right? Not for university research teams, not for public, but not anymore. Thanks to the uh, series, uh, uh, serious developments in the, uh, the, the enabling technologies like electronics, computing, um, communication, etc. These technologies have developed uh, uh, very seriously over the last decade. Now there are electronic components, very accurate and affordable, cheap, right? And there are communication modules, which are very fast, small in size, lightweight and affordable. And there are embedded platforms like Raspberry Pi uh, or uh, STM, whatever. And you can program things uh, and these things are very lightweight, consumes uh, uh, least amount of power. You can put it on the drones and develop your application, right? Drone is just a vehicle and application is running on these embedded platforms. So thanks to the, the development of electronics, communication and computer technologies, the drones have come out to the universities and the public in general from their original uh, places of birth, like in military. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the significant uh, maturity the technology has reached today in terms of sensing, controls, and also fail-safe uh, is remarkable. And also recent times, as I explained uh, previously, collision avoidance technologies and connectivity to big data uh, platforms, right? And vision-based landing and navigation. And in the near future, drones will be very, very smart tools, right? So while this is happening in the world, I'm proud to say that Sri Lanka also catching up very fast, right? So we, we are actually competing with the rest of the world uh, in, in terms of drone technology. So something we can be proud of as Sri Lankans. And uh, we are hoping that uh, Sri Lankan drone technology can be deployed very soon for Sri Lankan applications and not uh, stopping there. We want to bring our technology made in Sri Lanka brand in the drones to the region and the international markets. So that is our hope. We are working uh, very hard to achieve to those uh, 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 goals. So that's about it, uh, my oral part of the presentation. Uh, over to you for questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it was a very uh, comprehensive and uh, very informative presentation. Uh, you have put a lot of effort to uh, bring uh, all the real time uh, videos and to explain the drone cable. It's very interesting, uh, the, especially the applications are very interesting because uh, uh, you are hands on on this subject and I, I know you uh, uh, even demonstrating your drones in the in many national exhibitions, national and international exhibitions at BMICH, so I can remember them. Uh, so uh, I am very grateful for accepting my invitation to do this presentation today, Professor. And, my pleasure, uh, my pleasure.